Um, now, I'd very much uh, like to hand over to our chair for this evening, uh, Susan Aikenhead, uh, who's the director of RCN Scotland, actually in her second official week uh, in the post. Um, and previous uh, to that, uh, she was the deputy chief nursing officer in England. Um, so over to Susan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sarah. So uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, as Sarah said, uh, this is one of my official second week in, in the job. So absolutely delighted to, to be here tonight and chairing this session. Uh, and really nice to see in, in the participants' uh, details as well, many names and uh, of people that I recognise as, as well, ex-colleagues and, uh, and, and some friends too. So really looking forward tonight to um, a good discussion and lots of questions as, as well. Um, I'm going to introduce our expert guests uh, in a little while. We've got Jane Douglas and, and, and Duncan McDonald tonight who um, are, are going to, to be interviewed separately and then come together for more of a discussion, particularly around the questions that you're, you're going to, to submit, hopefully. Um, but I really want to also take the opportunity to say um, how pleased I am we've got this opportunity to discuss the impact of, of the pandemic uh, on care homes and older people's care tonight and, and especially take some time to really hear about the key role of, of nursing in this area, uh, which is such an important area and certainly um, came to, to the fore during the pandemic so far. I am really aware from previous roles um, that the role of, of the nurse in, in this area of care is multifaceted. Um, you juggle an awful lot of balls, as, as, as I'm sure uh, those of you that are working in, in that sector uh, recognise, you know, whether you're an advocate, champion, carer, clinician, you know, so multifaceted all, all the components of the roles that you do on a daily basis and, and while delivering very high acuity and very complex care as, as well. And we know over the past years, it's got even more complex uh, as, as well. And that's obviously been made so much more challenging in the pandemic environment as well. Also really uh, aware of the, during the challenging times, it's been very much a conduit between family members and, and residents as well, and, and reassuring family members that have been unable to visit and, and see their loved ones about how they're coping, as well as obviously having to give and receive some really difficult messages as, as well. So it's a huge pr privilege tonight to um, connect many RCN members and, and, and colleagues, uh, those that work in these roles and, and those that are here tonight that are just really interested in hearing and, and learning about it. Uh, and, and also those of you that are also probably, uh, you know, have families uh, or carers as, as, as residents want to join in the discussion as, as well. So everyone is, is really welcome tonight. Uh, and it's really great to be able to share this valuable learning across the country and hear from our experts. Uh, and also have the opportunity as I say, for you to ask some questions as, as well. So we're going to um, hear from uh, Jane Douglas, Dr. Jane Douglas first. And Jane uh, is probably well known to, to many of, of you in, in Scotland. Um, she's currently Chief Executive for a registered charity in the Scottish Borders, uh, which has two care homes, a community resource centre and a training centre. Uh, the charity aims to support older people and people with disabilities. It specialises in supporting people who are living with dementia and aims to be a centre of, of excellence. And prior to that, Jane was Principal Assistant for Social uh, Care and Health within Scottish Borders Council. She's a registered nurse, uh, and after qualifying in Coventry, she moved to Jersey uh, as a staff nurse. And then it was on her return when she um, moved into the third sector and the independent sector as, as well. Not only that, after qualifying as an RN, she undertook a diploma in health and social care with the OU and then went on to achieve her degree in law in 2005. And then obviously got a bit bored and decided to go back in 2010 and uh, graduated with an MSc in dementia, dementia studies. And then in 2017 did her PhD. I don't know where you find the time to, <laughs> to do this, Jane. Very impressive. Uh, and then in 2019, delighted to say that Jane was awarded the Queen's Nurse title as well, just as, as recognition of all the work that she's done too. So as you can see, absolute expert in the field and, and really delighted that she's agreed to take some time tonight and, and really talk about her experiences uh, during the pandemic as, as well. So we're going to make this very much just like a conversation as, as much as we possibly can. There's not any right or wrong answers or, or whatever and make it as organic as we, as we possibly can under these uh, IT conditions. But Jane, just really to kick off, it's, it's you know, some of this 
what's happened over the pandemic has all been become a bit of a blur really hasn't it but do you remember what your first memory of, of COVID was how you kind of heard about it and, and when the, you actually started to realise that this was you know going to be a, a huge problem and it actually was a, a, a pandemic? Yes. Um, <clears throat> hello, everybody. Yeah, I, um, uh, my nephew works in China and he was back from China in October uh, 2019. He was wanting um, due to go back to China in January, February time 2020 and couldn't get that because of the um, outbreak in China. At that time, in December, January time, I remember hearing about it on the news. I wasn't particularly concerned. They'd had SARS viruses before, never in thought that it would come uh, to become a pandemic and then come February time it's my sister's 60th birthday we were down to see her and it, I think I remember thinking I don't think I'll be here for a while now that, that was the last time I saw her because obviously then we went into lockdown I think probably mid-February uh, towards mid-March was when we started to, to, to panic ourselves um, and we locked our care down out, we locked down our care home on the 12th of March um, just because it, it, it was all around us, the noise and the, the concern and the fear actually of what was happening and, and, and the fear of the care homes really. I, I was very, very frightened for the people who were living in care homes at that time. And, and what was your uh, particular role within that response, um, you know, from a kind of leadership perspective, um, the kind of business planning, the, the clinical care and everything as, as well and support. I'd imagine that there's lots of things that, again, you're, you're juggling at, at that time. How, how did you kind of approach it and, and your role in it? Yeah, um, I mean, I was, um, I headed everything up actually. Um, I just kind of, it was all down to me. So um, obviously everybody helped, um, but I had to take that real leadership role. Um, I had worked in the council, as you said, as principal assistant and was involved in emergency planning during the floods and we had to evacuate a care home and, and obviously through snow, bad snow and stuff like that. So I took that experience and just used it and said, right, let's get together. So before we actually locked down, we two weeks before that we were already developed a safety huddle meeting and we met every single morning and we went through everything so have we got PPE how are we going to get PPE by this time we were already realizing we weren't going to get what we needed um, we had no masks and I think care homes were criticized for that but we don't stop masks we stop PPE but we wouldn't ordinarily stop masks um, and that was our biggest fear we didn't have these masks in stock and um, there were other things like how we're going to continue to procure um, cleaning fluid um, staff rotors everything really we had to look at the whole aspect of running a care home and making sure that staff were safe residents were safe and we had enough staff so um we looked at skill we did a skills audit all staff put down from every department where they could work what they were willing to move to if needed we looked at separate rotors and i think most care homes did this and then we had this massive plan and we just worked through it and we set up areas so that if we were covid was to come in we would have everything set up ready just to go so you're if somebody was in isolation very nursing kits were already we we did struggle with the PPE and we actually ended up phoning around our local suppliers and we also phoned our dentists and our vets and everybody we knew and we got masks and and stuff like that from the dentists who were closed down so that was really lucky just to give us that supply eventually the hubs opened up in Scotland and that was really good and that happened quite quickly but initially there was this fear in my head that people just wouldn't have equipment and um, if COVID was coming in and I, I think I don't know how anybody else felt but I felt it was going to come in it was inevitable um, it was almost like it will happen um, so there was there was that need to be absolutely on top of everything really and, and lead, lead people were looking to you to, to, to know the answers really and we didn't know the answers at that time um, because we were, I don't know how anybody else felt but we had no communication from anybody at that period it was just we were just on our own and so, so your previous role, you felt that certainly helped with the approach. So did you have a kind of off the shelf kind of plan that you could you could kind of use to a certain extent or was it all kind of up, up here? I think it was, it was probably mostly in my head. Um, <laughs> um, but I do think that the staff team that we had I gathered around me to help in that, you know, your lead nurses, your procurement people, your um, housekeeper, your head housekeeper, everybody, your catering uh, head chef and catering manager, everybody played a part in, in thinking of their departments and the things that might be affected. So little things like, you know, 
we are in a care home, you want to give choice, you, you know, we do a cheese platter, but you couldn't get cheeses that you would normally offer. There was a change in some of the food supplies. Um, so that all had to be looked at. And, um, and then uh, there was also about looking at staff who, who may be vulnerable. So obviously you have people who've got other long-term conditions and they're working, you know, you're severe asthmatic, you're, you, you have people who um, might have Crohn's disease, things like that. And um, some of them, had to be followed but before that I was looking at what would you do if there was an outbreak and how and staff were frightened they didn't want they were like I don't want to do that I don't want to look after anybody with COVID you know because the TV was showing you all these awful things so we had to work through a lot of those anxieties and actually also support the people who were were people who, who were classed as vulnerable. And um, and do you think because as, as nurses obviously we, we've got a lot of um, infection prevention control um, skills and ways of working as as, as well and, and obviously flu every, you know every year as, as well was there anything there that you could draw from too yeah so we um, immediately before we we locked down we started our um, we started sessions with staff looking at infection prevention control um, we looked at donning and doffing and we showed them the videos and then we talked through them now what was really good about that was we had staff of small groups groups in in our training room and while the donning and doffing procedures and discussions didn't take that long the sessions took about over an hour because staff it was a time for staff to just talk about their anxieties and what what very much came across for me with the staff at that time was their fear not the fear of catching covid the fear of giving it to residents they were so frightened of bringing covid into the care home and and infecting residents and interestingly the residents were so pragmatic about it all but that the staff had this complete fear about they were going to infect residents and cause illness and and we had to alleviate that fear um and then they were frightened they were going to infect their families if they were living still living at home the younger ones so there was a lot of um time needed just to talk through these anxieties that people were quite rightly feeling because we've never been through anything like this before in our lives um so i think as an and i think as we have nurses in our care homes, um, yes, we, we were able to draw on our infection prevention and control training. I'd worked in infectious diseases, so I had that background back in the day when I first qualified, actually, and it's something you don't forget, and it doesn't actually change that much. Um, but, but caring for somebody in a care home using infection prevention control isolation procedures is very very different to a hospital because the hospital's set up just for that and your care home isn't so you've got to adapt and apply different different ways of working in order to to ensure that you're safe and your practice is safe and um and things were moving at pace the evidence was was kind of changing quite mm -hmm. rapidly as as well wasn't it and and so so how did you kind of because uh, you talk about alleviating fears and and obviously that leadership role is as well how, how did you do that when actually, um, you know, that, that evidence wasn't huge and, and, and it was difficult to kind of with a 100% you know, say this is what's happening or that's going to happen too. How, how did you, you handle that, particularly with residents and their, their families as well? Yes, um, I think uh, for me it was really difficult actually because everything was changing, as you say, at pace. You, you would do one thing one day and then you were told, to, oh no, you do it this way and then you do it that way. And there was that balance of keeping everybody informed, but also over informing and, and staff would get to the point like, well, it's too much change, too much information, but there was a need to keep them on top of what was happening. It was the fear that I felt that I would miss something. So I was constantly checking everything. And sometimes you didn't get the information or you'd hear it through Twitter that there's guidance out or there's a change with this. So you really did have to be absolutely astute and on it to, to ensure that you were keeping up to date with what was happening. Um, and I think it's just, you, I, was, I was the communicator to all people, so I had my board of trustees, my staff, my residents and my relatives, and relatives were kind of pushed out at this stage, they didn't know what was going on, they were, we were locked down, we, we obviously had to keep in touch with them and we, we have a, an email system and then we started to set up Zoom meetings, so our relatives meetings just went to Zoom um, on a regular basis just to keep keep up to date with them but that didn't happen immediately because we were too busy with everything else so it was a really hard time I think and we felt I know when I, I wrote a blog about this but I actually wrote about that feeling of quietness that when we shut the care home it was so quiet there was a silence um, that I've never experienced before care home is a vitality it is vital vitality and vibrance and life and actually suddenly the doors were shut with a clang and it, you just felt you were out to drift really um, so there was that need to communicate with the families. Uh, we've learned a lot since then. We have a, we've developed a concierge role now who 
actually helped maintain that communication with all families, a great role, um, but we didn't have that at the time and we were so busy. Um, that I, I think probably um, that's one of the things we could have improved on was right at the beginning, the communication with families. I mean, they knew we were shutting down and we, we did give them the weekend before to, we, we went to complete lockdown. Um, but but I think it was really hard. It was hard for everybody, particularly hard for families and, and residents that period. And and obviously some of your residents will be confused, um, have, have dementia, et cetera, as, as well, which adds a, another layer of complexity. I would imagine that when you're trying to um, keep um, social distancing and, and things like that as, as well, yeah. how, did, how did you cope with, with, with that? Because that must have been really tricky. Yeah, we never um, actually left. We never did the whole um, everybody has to stay in the room thing. We um, we laid out our dining areas and our chairs so that they were socially distanced, and we enabled communal dining for those that wanted to to continue because obviously it was really important that they had that social interaction. Um, in our specialist care home for people living with dementia, they're very small. We only have nine residents in in each care house. Um, and they, uh, there's a lot of space. So while there's not that many people living in the houses, the houses have got a lot of space with lots of areas to go and sit. So we created more sort of seating areas so they could spend time. There's there's another room that they go into, and then we mark the floors, although they wouldn't stay, you'd go up and the chairs would be moved all over the place. But it was just a way of showing that we were trying to facilitate that. But you, you couldn't, and actually, you know, I would go up and I'd see two residents sitting together on a sofa and the other one was assisting another resident and, and at their home, they live there, they've been together all this time. We were like, you know, as much as we can try, you, you can't, you can't force that to happen. And um, you just have to go with the flow really and, and, and not cause any further stress for, for the residents and during their safe and, 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 and supporting them to wash their hands and, and be as, you know, maintain their IPC as well as, as as the staffs but I think we we never went into that um phase of people were in their rooms at all the only time we've ever done that is if we have had to test somebody and we've zoned the area as red and, and and everybody then has to stay in the room in that zone but otherwise we have allowed people to maintain social distancing and small group activities and is it cause um, or confusion and distress for residents as well when uh, the people that were caring for them had masks and, and had, you know, protective equipment on as, as, as well? I think that when we first went into the masks, I think we had um the visors but we took them off because one we got people we got staff at really good glass you know the good goggles um which yeah. they don't need to wear anymore um but the visors do did, did actually um affect particularly people who you couldn't see you properly and all they could see was this yeah. visor the masks interestingly i think were more of a hindrance to people who know us um to 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 who 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 use a much more communication through verbal and talking, whereas uh, people who are living with severe dementia, they just one of the staff said to me actually she says I'm really surprised that they haven't it doesn't seem to have bothered anybody the mask in fact it, one of our ladies did put a mask on and she, she explained to me that we have to wear these now so so residents themselves were starting because the masks were out and they would they would put them on, um, but actually staff were very good at using other other communication methods and we were interviewing staff recently for a creative therapist post and we were interviewing internally and we were talking to staff and one of the questions was what about the PPE and what do you do in order to support communication and they, the stuff they were telling us that they do now you know they're very aware of using their hands their body their gestures their eyes smiling much more over expression so I think people have become very adept at, at communicating better but it is difficult if you're hard of hearing as well and you haven't got very good sight so difficult to, to communicate uh, but yeah we found that our people um, uh, who who were living with dementia were very accepting of us with the masks on but I think it was the the, the, the visors I think cause concern because you do look very odd I think walking down the corridor with with a, with a plastic visor on but we don't wear those at the moment we don't have any Covid so we don't wear them. And and obviously the, the physical environment you said people didn't stay in the rooms or anything but um, and, and I'm also conscious that it's it's these people's home as, as well isn't it? It's, yes. it's not like and obviously storage space is not like you've got a big ward that you can put things in a, in, in a cupboard and, and it's got plenty of room and stuff like that is as well was there any particular things that you had to do 
um, you know, to keep it um, safe, but remaining, uh, you know, like, like still their home. Uh, and also you're talking about PPE and stuff, you know, where did you store that? What were the kind of environmental things that you had to particularly do? Yeah, we did have to change some of the environment. So one of the things I didn't want to do, but I did do in the end was we put up the PPE stations on the wall outside the, the residence rooms just because it was the easiest thing to do. And actually um, we just put what the way our one home is built, we, we, we actually just have two rooms and then there's a wall. So we just put one up. So it wasn't too intrusive. It, you don't really notice it. Um, we actually in the our care home for people with, who are living with dementia, we didn't want to put anything on the walls in there. So we actually just had little drawers outside each room with all the PPE and so it doesn't look too too sort of institutional. And um, we we kept things pretty much the same. We kind of removed quite a lot of if there was lots of old magazines, stuff like that, we got rid of them. But we still had stuff lying around and just really up the cleanliness really and wiping everything down and continue wiping, continue wiping. Um, but we actually left things pretty much the same. I think initially our plan was if, if, if somebody had developed COVID, we would, um, we, we had in the plan that we would not remove all the belongings out of that room, but anything that wasn't needed, which we you tend to tidy up a room if somebody's not well, but you wouldn't remove their personal belongings. You just make sure that there was um, uh, wipes in there to clean around on a regular basis. And, and from the staff training and, and education, what, did you have to bring in MD and kind of externally or do it remotely, whatever way it would be doing, uh, or, or did you do all that in, in house as, as well yourselves? Because obviously you've got a lot of, of expertise in, in your own background, but that's not the same everywhere, is it? No. How, how I think we we were quite lucky. We actually did it all ourselves. So myself and the lead nurse um, held sessions with with all of the staff, and we talked through um, the donning and doffing procedures, and talked through. The, then they had the training online for infection prevention and control, and then there's the constant. Um, awful word audit but yes actually observing practice is really important and it's constant because one of the things we found was that people became we didn't I, I, I really cautiously say this we we haven't had an outbreak I say it with caution because obviously COVID's still out there and I, I always think I don't want to tempt fate but um people become complacent and we had a meeting with our staff because one of our one of our members of staff had a positive um COVID test but it was a uh, a false positive so we had a, a group meeting with staff after that and one of the things they talked about was safety that they felt safe in the care home whereas it, they didn't feel safe in the supermarket so were absolutely vigilant they, they felt really safe in the care home because they've been working in the care home by this point by for 12 months um during during this period or you know 11 months so so it's interesting how people become complacent they feel safe in this environment so we had to remind staff that you have to abide by all the principles but it is one of those things that observing practice you have to do it continually we do we do that hand hygiene checks four times a day uh, four, four people a day and then obviously just checking their their um, donning and doffing on a regular basis um, it's one of the things they get asked through track and trace is how did you take your your um, PPE off and one of our staff she got really nervous and she said something wrong and she ended up having to socially isolate she had to end up having to go off and isolate because track and trace said she didn't take her mask off at the right time and I said well she doesn't take a mask off anyway so she, she probably didn't you know but it's really important that you do understand the order and and that and, and do, you, do you think the relationships the staff have with, with the residents that they felt particularly accountable for them as, as, as well? Because it is like their home and, and it's a very different relationship, isn't it, to someone that's yeah. perhaps looking after somebody in a, in, in a hospital ward? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I am. Um, it's interesting how relationships have become stronger because they are that person for, for, for over 100 days. They were that relatedness, that that contact with that person uh, on a very regular basis. And staff have worked and worked and worked and covered shifts because, they'll, you know, they want to make sure that we're fully staffed and there isn't much else to do out there. So they've been at work a long time. Uh, and uh, I don't know where we, we our staff work in teams and they work in zoned areas. So they've been working with the same residents for over two, three years. And um, they, they know these people really, really well. And I had a meeting with, with them uh, a couple of months ago. And actually they were just, every time we're doing this talk around about the residents and, and when they were talking about the residents, he knew stuff about these residents that I didn't know. And, and just the affection they talked about, the, the way they talk about them. And, and, and actually, 
the closeness has, and I'm, I'm sure um, people listening will find that with their own staff, but the closeness and resident bond to, to staff bond has, has really, really been sealed because of this, um, because they've had to put that extra effort in to, to, to be that, that person that is interacting with them. And, and how did you support your staff then? Because with, with that, it, it's great to hear that. But that, that accountability also puts more stress in a way on your staff as, as well, doesn't it? And, and pressure. Yeah. So how did you give them that kind of um, wrap around themselves to, to support your staff? Yeah, I, at, right at the beginning, uh, when they were incredibly frightened and fearful of bringing COVID in and just overwhelmed with everything, um, we, we supported them to take time out, just said it's okay not to be okay, and if you want to just go off in the staff room, get a cup of tea, have a cry, do anything it's okay to do that, give them permission to, to do that, permission to speak up about how they're feeling, permission to challenge, um, but also we, we have an commu online communication system, so I would write emails, uh, messages to them about how thankful I was and amazing. I mean, they do. I am very humbled by the work that they do and the commitment they have. Um, we also did a bacon roll Sunday, so people would get a bacon roll on Sunday. But just stop that because people started to put in how they like the bacon. You know, I don't like mine crispy. I want this. And it's like, I've got 60 odd staff on. It's quite a lot for the chef. Um, so we had scones, tray bakes, and now we have treat baskets. So they get a big treat basket over the weekend. So just different things like that that help have helped, I think, support staff and know that we do value them but and just being there for them and understanding that it's hard and you know I think people were really buoyant just de at December where you know we were getting um Christmas was coming and the vaccine was coming and all these things were happening and then boom we were back into to to, to lockdown and I, I think people I think as, I, I think I saw our staff take a dip uh in in their morale at that stage because it, it's been such a long haul for everybody um but but actually they're amazing and and and, it, and i think supporting our staff is they're the the most valuable asset we have so we have to support them no absolutely i completely agree and and you know there's been discussion um across all the countries as to how we uh, give our staff a bit of a break and, and recharge um you know, when lockdown goes and, and you know we, we kind of head into whatever the new normal looks like as, as, as well because the pressure has been unrelenting mm. hasn't it and, and, and how we still balance delivering services and, and the you know the, the business as usual but give them a break as, as, as well are, are you looking at that have you got any innovative ideas that anyone else can can use around that too or is it still too soon to think about that yeah haven't haven't actually thought about that I mean I suppose our staff have been able to take leave, um, but obviously not had a break, proper break. They haven't been able to get, get away, but they have been able to get away from the care home, which I think some, I know some care homes haven't been able to do that because they've had um, infections and, and, you know, their staff has, you know, had to be on duty and probably not been able to, uh, to take their holidays. But I think it's more about people just getting away completely and having that freedom to, to do normal things and, and spend time. And that, I, I think, Everybody needs to spend time with their families. I think, you know, we, we recognise it for our relatives and our residents, but ourselves even have not had that same contact. And I think that's really important for all of us. Well, that's good. And, and so just conscious we're coming to the, the end of our time. So just really to finish um, with, with a question is looking back, and it's always easy to look back retrospectively, isn't it? Yeah. Is, is there anything you think, any one particular thing you think I, I would have done that differently? I mean, obviously in the time and space you are it, and, and the, the lack of evidence of things moving at, at pace, um, you know, it, it, nobody would say that it should have been done, but is there anything kind of learning that you would want to share that you think was, that was one particular thing that's important? I think we we were very well prepared um, uh, for 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 once we knew it was here. Um, I think one of the things I would change uh, is I would have um, preferred to open to open up to visiting earlier than we did because it was over a hundred days, and I became my fear changed from COVID to to actually the anxiety about people not having uh, their, their relationships maintained. And, and, and it was the wellness of the relatives as much as the wellness of the, the residents. So I think I would, I would, I felt, I was so frightened to, everybody was so frightened to have people coming into their care homes. And I didn't, I was like, oh, it's a big step. But actually I think I would have done that earlier and, and been able to do that. 
No, as I say, it's always easier, isn't it, to look back retrospectively. Yeah. But but some of the learning I, I think is really valuable as as well. So thank you very much for that. I could see some comments popping up in chat as, as we were speaking, and we'll, we'll go back and pick up questions after we spoke to Duncan as as well. But many were kind of very much reiterating what you were saying, particularly from feeling isolated. Uh, you know PPE etc as, as well and and uh, you know quite a few congratulating you for what you've done as as, oh, as well so, which is, is, is really nice uh, from other colleagues that obviously work in, in the same sector as as well so thank you for that um, and we'll just get a little bit of a, a breather just now and then I'm going to uh, introduce Duncan and bring him in as as well so I'm um, delighted to be uh, talking with our second expert tonight, um, who is Duncan MacDonald. And uh, Duncan qualified as an enrolled nurse in the 90s. He's worked in various care home uh, dementia units and they left nursing for, for a while, but returned as a carer in Erskine home. That's well known to everybody up north. He uh, worked up to senior carer. They went back to university at the age of 42 to become a registered nurse. You look, you still look very young though, Duncan, so <laughs> questioning that. Uh, you worked a year in ICU, um, but your his first love was always working with residents living with dementia. So when the chance came to go back to Erskine, he jumped at it. Then been promoted to clinical lead, then house manager. And, and one thing that Duncan says is by working at all the different levels of care and roles that he's done, it's, it's really um, much easier to understand the challenges that, that staff have in, in, in different uh, in, in different positions and particularly facing this year as, as well. And you are another one that's that's doing a further learning as, as well. I'm very impressed by two of you tonight by doing all this time to do this. You've gone back to university for a postgrad diploma in integrated um, community nursing as, as well. So so really delighted, as I say, to have you along tonight. And you have been working all day today as, as well. So yeah. and you're actually a nurse at the moment. So um, you, you've got, you said you've got a sign in the door saying, do not disturb, but uh, if MD comes in, that's the reason for it. Yeah. <laughs> so very similar um, questions and, and, and kind of looking back and, and any advice uh, and, and kind of thinking you, you've had as, as well as, as Jane was talking. Can you remember what your first memory of, of COVID was, how you heard about it and, and the penny started to drop, this is a pandemic, this is going to be bad? Yeah, so I, it was last mid February last year, and I was actually off with a DVT, so I could watch twenty four hour news for those weeks, and I could just I could see it just coming towards us. You know, you you've seen the, the the stories from Italy and Spain, the care homes there, and the terrible stories, and I felt it was like you were watching a tsunami coming towards you, just waiting for the wave to hit, and I was just desperate to get back to work because you could just see it getting closer and closer. You know, and, and the stories were just getting worse and worse. And you just thought, how hard will it hit us then? And so what was the, the response then in, in your organisation? How did you kind of start to mobilise and prepare for, for what was happening? Was there any particular framework or any, anything that you all came together and, and said, this is what we need to do and how we prioritise? Or was it a little bit more kind of fluid? Um, at the time, I think everything was fluid, but I think we were lucky here we've got a good, quality assurance team, you know, that, that were sort of giving us uh, IPC guidance. Um, they were they were showing us, they were, they were making their own Donning and Dauphin videos for the staff to watch. You know, there was more learn pro modules on and fetch control. There was more audits out at the time. Um, our director of care, the same as what Jane was saying, we were real, real struggling to get masks. We had other PPE, but not masks. And I think at one point he was actually buying them on eBay to get his mask in the building just for when we did need them. Um, at that time, you know, they were sitting in storage, but we knew at one point we were going to need them for our residents. So it was more a sort of you just about preparedness and then walking down the building, you know, stopping the footfall. We've got a really busy building. It's like a community here. We've got a cafe on site, you know, we've got a shop on site and all that had to close for the relatives and the residents. So it was really just decreasing the footfall and being ready for what was coming. And, I mean that's a lot. That's, that's a lot of logistics, isn't it, to sort it out as 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 well. And and how did you kind of um, for your training and education of your staff as as well? Did you have a particular way of, of doing that? Um, was it learning from others, or was it what was coming in from the centre, or how it did you was it? yeah, it was hands on learning. You know, you would you get all the staff every safety brief, every handover. You would just be you know telling them all again how to do. Do it all we would be showing um, with a practice development nurse who came around and did hand washing lectures and hand washing, you know, same sort of seminars. So we just put all that in place and just made sure that everyone was ready. We had signs at every sink showing the hand washing, you know, the, the protocol. Um, and it was really just 
constantly reminding staff about like, the hand hygiene and you know the infection prevention control procedures. And, and what about your residents and, and, and their families? How did you kind of work with them and, and explain what the, the planning was? So I'm in a dementia house again. So we have 30 residents with from like mild to, to advanced dementia. So it was, for the residents, um, it was quite tough. They just didn't understand really what was happening. Um, the families, the families were fantastic. You know, they could they could just see the news, they knew what was happening. They were keeping in touch with us, we were keeping in touch with them. Um, we have a site called Workplace that we use a lot for um, like for staff, and it's, it's like a, sort of a Facebook site, but it's like for the organisation. But we've also got a family group within that, so the families could join that, so they could still get the information, they could still see their loved ones, and they're still keeping up to date with what was happening here, but it was, it was tough at the time. Yeah, and, and with patients, we, we, Jane and I were obviously speaking about patients with dementia and added complexity with them and, and, and you know, the, the distancing and, and uh, you know, mask, etc. Yeah. as well. Was there anything different that you did to, to what Jane's approach was? Because obviously- Not really, no, it was pretty similar. I mean, obviously we had problems with um, physical distancing and we tried to encourage it as much as possible, but, you know, people will be people and, you know, they, they want to be together. Um, the masks again, the same as Jane. The masks weren't really, you know, a big deal. They, they got used to the masks really, really quickly, and we had plenty of residents who were also wearing the masks as well. Um, and you know, uh -huh, uh, we had no problems with that at all. It was just really the physical distancing um, and just trying to keep them safe, knowing what was coming towards us. And, and there's quite a lot of comments around feeling. Um, isolated and, and the, the pace was, was difficult to keep up with as, as, as well. Was that your experience or did you have a, a good kind of network across the country that you could support each other or, or did you feel isolated as well? Because obviously you're a well-known big organisation. Yes. Um, no, we did. I mean, we, the guidance was changing so much and so fast. You know, you, you went in days off and came back and you were playing catch up to see what the guidance had changed by then. Um, and it was really just trying to keep all the staff up to date as well. Within Erskine, we had good communication, but yeah, there was not a lot, you know, we were following the guidance at the time, but it was really just, you're, you're making up your own guidance and hoping that it was, it was suitable, you know, and just, you had to keep going with that. Yeah, so it's a lot of pressure, isn't it? And and obviously what, one of the things in, in, in your kind of IOG was the different roles that you've done and, and you're now in, in, in a leadership position as, as, as well. So, when you look back on your kind of leadership um, approach to it, how did you work with colleagues and, and, and staff, etc.? Was there anything particular that you did to, you know, again, as we were talking about before, um, you keep them safe, kind of psychologically <laughs> as, as well as physically? I think it was just making yourself seen. You know, you, you were here every day with the staff. You were, you were doing the same jobs as the staff. We at Erskine, the managers have clinical days as well, so we're on the floor as well. We're not, you know, you know we're not away from that. And it keeps you involved as well, and it keeps you. Um, you, you see the staff, you see the problems they're going through, you see the, the the issues they have and the concerns they have, and you're there just to just to listen, you know, and reassure. That was the, really that was all we could do was just listen and reassure, and try and tell the staff that we would just we were all in it together, and we would get through it together. Yeah, and and with the the family and and, and relatives, um, was there any particular way that you kept them in in touch because. It, oh, you know, I've seen, as we all have, the use of IT, and we're doing it tonight mm -hmm. as well, aren't we? Using it differently. Uh, and I know, obviously, in, in hospitals that um, use of iPads and, and, you know, you to talk to uh, to, to patients. Um, but obviously, you know, your residents are not patients, they're residents, it's their home is, as, as well. Was was there anything particular that you did was slightly innovative or you? We, we pretty much did the same. We, we got in more iPads and, and more tablets and we used a, a lot of Zoom calls, a lot of FaceTime calls. Um, yeah, uh, we spoke to the families on the phone. If the resident needed a wee bit of help with that, we would sit with them, you know, and, and just support them through the calls. Um, regular contact with the families, keep them up to date with anything, you know, and it was just really just keeping that contact between the resident and, you know, the, the families, keeping, keeping it going. And hopefully, you know, just let them know that we're still there for them and you know the, the families were really understanding and I've got to say you know every one of them were just you know they could see the struggles we were having and sometimes you had to say to them, no you can you can phone you can phone anytime you can call anytime we can arrange you no know, zoom calls anytime don't worry about us being busy you just 
you know, if you want to speak to your family, you let us know and we would do that. So it was, they were, in a way, they sort of, they were trying to help us well, we were trying to help them, you know, so it was like, nah, it would be a give and take. And, and from a, a physical environment, I, I know you, you said yours is a, you've got a big footfall, etc. too. Did you um, end up changing that kind of footfall to, um, to make it run a, a different way that made it easier for IPC? protocols we put into the yeah. place? Uh, so, so the whole building, we what we did was we started, all the staff would have their tea breaks within their houses. Um, so there are six houses within Erskine and we would have our tea breaks within the houses. The cafe would close down the shop or the reduce visiting hours. Um, you know, and the, the corridors were all signposted for the extent to one side of the corridor. And it was really just as much as, reducing that footfall as much as possible. When the visiting started back up again, it was outside visiting, so it was trying to make a one-way system. So the relatives would come in one door, the resident would go in another, and they would meet, and then they would separate again. You know, it was really just as much as trying to keep everybody as separate as possible. Yeah. And, and did you have a lot of story spaces as well, or was that a challenge for you two? Always a challenge. It's a challenge at the best of times, but in the last year, it's definitely been a challenge. And it's trying to keep everything separated and, you know, easy to clean and, you know, as much as possible. We are, you know, a, a nursing home cupboard ends up full of absolutely everything. And, you know, suddenly we're having to think about IPC much, much more and, you know, try and keep everything in its place and, and easily cleanable. And, and obviously we're, we're more now aware of, of the kind of health inequalities and the higher risk to, to certain um, vulnerable groups, uh, particularly with comorbidities, long-term conditions, et cetera, as, as well. And, and obviously the, the cohort residents you have, have have got a lot of these issues too. Was there anything particular that you did to to um, with, with that group or was it just we, making sure you kept everybody safe? I think, yeah, just make sure everybody was safe. Any of our, our, our staff who, who did have to furlough or shield, then we supported that, you know, and, and with, a, with a few that were off, like, like shielding at the time. Um, you know, and there was a few people that you not know, had to force the shield, but, you know, they were, they were desperate to come to work. And it was like, no, for your health, you know, you, you really should be shielding. Um, yeah, resident-wise, I mean, massive comorbidities, but you just followed the guidance, um, followed the cleaning regime, and just, and just hope that, it worked out well. Yeah, and and a lot of the comments that, that be coming in around the the importance of the role of, of the registered nurse and and the complexity that um, nursing um, support workers have as 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 well. I mean, it, it, so and there's been a huge amount of learning, hasn't there, over, over yes. the years as, as as well. Uh, you know, you you've done all these these different roles. Is is there anything particularly you've picked out that how we really demonstrate as 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 nurses and, and support workers, what, what we kind of bring to the table here is as well, because a lot of it has gone on before, but it's been quite invisible, hasn't it? Yes. Whereas during, during the pandemic, it's really been brought to the front, particularly in the media and other places as, as, as well. I mean, how would you describe what, what the profession has, has done? I think it was just really, um, it was changing so much and, you know, and the nurses were having to change how they thought so much as well that we, at the start, you know, the symptoms we were looking for weren't the ones that we were finding, you know, and we ha were having to adapt to, like, you know, we have elderly people, so the symptoms, we, so we had some people with, like, no cough, no fever, but their tests were coming back positive because they had other symptoms that we hadn't really known at the time, you know, and you're testing for one thing, but it was just to keep on top of that and for the nurses all to be aware that any change in the, in the resident's condition could mean you know, there was something, there was something there and, and tacked on that. And it was just that constant learning, you know, and, and the constant changing and just keeping up with that and, and just supporting, you know, the other staff as well. And, and the, the carers and the senior carers were fantastic. You know, for the last year, we, we are not their families, but we have been their families, you know, in the absence of like the, the relatives coming in. So, and it's been hard, but again, as James was saying, They've all stepped up, you know, we've, we've tried to put in more activities, even if it's not the same. We couldn't have the concerts we had, we couldn't have the sing-alongs we had, but we still found stuff to do to keep these, because these residents were much more time in their hands they didn't have before because they're not having visitors in, you know, they're not having like, people in the building they did have. So it was trying to fill that time for them as well. So it was like from all, all levels. And, and really complex care then if you're having to kind of work out somebody's asymptomatic but starting to show very subtle clinical signs as 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 well as to how to look after them 
um, and, and also I would imagine trying to avoid a hospital ad admission as, as well because it you know I would, I would imagine that it would be, be a bit of a sense of dread that if somebody had to be admitted what that outcome might be as, as, as well. How, how did you cope with, with that? That must have been really quite a lot of, of pressure on staff. It was, um, so again we had, we, we set up what we called a wobble room and if anybody was feeling a bit you know, and, and, they, and it was out of the house, so they could get out of the house and go somewhere else just for a few minutes, just, you know, have, have, a, have a break from the place, get away from the place, um, and then come back when they felt ready. Um, we, we just, the staff just pulled together and just, you know, it was just all sort of peer support. You know, everybody just talked to each other. Everybody was scared at the time. Everybody was frightened. No one knew what was really happening or how bad it would get or how long it would last, you know, and we just, it was just supporting each other and, as, as a whole team, you know, so everybody talked to each other. I could talk to my staff about my fears. They could talk to me. And it was really just making sure that, you know, there was that sounding board that we could all discuss it with each other and be open. Yeah. And and what about end of life care? Did that change at, at all, the way that you delivered that, whether it was COVID or, or, or non-COVID related? Really? Because I would imagine you would have um, end of life care that you would be normally delivering uh, as, as, as well. Yeah. Um, um, so for end-of-life care, we still facilitated um, relatives to come in. They could still come in for the essential visit. So end-of-life care, had, as long as they followed the rules, we had the PPE in place for them as well. Um, if the resident had to be um, barrier nursed at the time, then, you know, everything was still in place. The, the essential end-of-life care didn't really change. You know, everything was still the same as what it was before, but just with increased infection prevention control procedures. And obviously they couldn't have... We could, our rules were like one member of family could come in for a short period of time and then they would go away again um, and that's what we did and it wasn't nice but it was better than you know what yeah yeah, yeah very difficult so you know I, I said to, to Jane as, as well it's always easy to look back in retrospect but is, is there anything that you think that you would have done differently that just from a kind of sharing point of view or do you think that you because of the pace as, as we said before and, and, and that evidence base was, was gathering that you wouldn't have it would be very difficult to, to do that or is there, is there any one thing you think I really think that would have worked better if we'd done x y or z I can't really think I think you're right the, at the time everything was changing so fast and we were just you know swept along with it and just trying to you know keep everybody as safe as possible and I think right now and we're pretty much still living it, you know, so I, I don't know if now's the time to look back on last year. I think maybe once it's over, or I mean, this could be the new normal, I don't know. But, you know, um, I think once we get back to whatever the new normal is, then maybe then. But right now, ah, we're just we're just getting on with it and just and keeping on going until we come through the other side. Yeah, I can understand why. I suppose that the other thing that strikes me is the amount of expertise and experience that, that you have and, and, and your colleagues have, have gained. Um, and it is very difficult, isn't it, when you're right in the middle of it, you can't see the width of the trees as, as well as to how you kind of think about, you know, what's worked and what hasn't as well. But how, how do we lock that learning down for the future? You know, what, how do we really, um, because as you quite rightly say, we're still in it just now and we don't know what the new norm is going to look like. But, you know, how, how do we make sure that with the experience that, that, that you all have and, and Jane and her colleagues as well, that we really learn from that, lock it down and, and have, uh, you know, kind of, are able to disseminate it out as, as well. I mean, particularly to, to um, you know, newly qualified nurses, nurses that are interested in coming to work in, in this sector as, as well. We're not allowed to download your brain, unfortunately. But, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on where that kind of learning should come together and, and sit? I think care home nursing has always sort of been the, the oh, like the second tier of nursing sometimes, you know, compared to like the, the NHS nurse or, or a real nursing, you know, and, and I was, I mean, for, I've been doing this for 30 years and it was always about a stigma of care home nursing. It was where you went to retire. Um, and we're trying to bring that back to care home nursing. It, it's so multifaceted. Um, the nurses here are so multi-skilled. They are, they're, they're not only being clinical nurses, they're being managers, they're being leaders, you know, they're being carers. They are doing everything and the expertise they bring to the role is amazing. Um, and it's just trying, trying to push that, you know, care home nursing is a viable alternative. You know, it's not, it's where, it's where you come to learn how to lead a team, you know, and where you come to learn how to, you don't have a doctor next door to you, you know, you, you are making those clinical decisions and decide what happens for that resident. Um, 
And I think also as well that going forward, it is their home, but we'll be much more aware of infection prevention and control and like cleaning procedures going on, you know, and, and the, the complete importance of that, you know, and just people will remember this and they'll learn from it and hopefully, you know, we'll see care home nursing in a new light after it. So what we, how, how do you think we should, um, you know, we should really demonstrate the acuity, complexity, you know, the rewarding career, modern 20 percent career it is as well, that it's, it's not, you know, a, a second tier, as, as, as you say. How do we get the, the word out there and, and, and spread that, particularly for student nurses that are coming mm -hmm. through as, as well, to expose them to actually, you know, that you, this is a, a really interesting, um, you know, career to have? What do we yeah. do to, to get that word out? So I have currently three nursing students with me just now. Um, and, you know, and it's just showing them what it's like. And they'll go back and tell their class, hopefully, you know, how much they enjoy that. Um, it's showing on social media what happens in nursing homes. Um, nursing homes aren't like there are places where people sitting in a semicircle watching a TV. We have things happening. We have activities you know, yesterday was pancake day and on, oh, we had pancakes for everyone. You know, it's just care home nursing is such a vibrant nursing um, and it's, we, we need to show that. And however we show it through either social media, whether we go to universities and talk to these, you know, nursing students and, and tell them what we do. Um, you know, and maybe when, you know, that's the community um, integrated nursing course that I'm doing and that's showing like, the community nurses from all places. So, you know, we're mixing it as well, we're sharing our expertise and getting it out there, like what we do here. Yeah, well, I think you're a brilliant example and an advocate, Duncan, for what the, the career uh, encompasses and, and uh, you can tell about your, your passion and, and commitment for it as, as well. So thank you so much for, for um, talking to us tonight as, as well. And um, I'm now going to, to bring back uh, Jane and I can see there's been lots and lots of comments and, and questions popping up. And I'm, I'm going to pass over to, to Sarah to filter the, the questions that we're going to, to put to two of you now. So Sarah, have you got a first question? Um, yeah, absolutely. We've got a number of questions coming in. So um, again, just to let people know to carry on posting them in the chat. And if you do want to, to raise your hand as well to ask your question, um, then that you, that you can find that in two places on Zoom, depending on your update. Um, it might be under the reactions button on the bottom of your screen. Um, or if you've got an older version of Zoom, you'll need to open the participants tab um, and then the hand raise function will be there. Um, so some of these questions have been coming in while you were talking, so it might be that um, um, one of you's already answered uh, uh, some of this uh, since the question's been asked. Um, so we had a couple of questions about um, the effects of isolation on residents, um, the things that you, what things that you could do to try and prevent and reduce the physical and mental impact of the indirect effects of COVID, um, and uh, alongside this question about uh, using outside space more. So were you able to, to use outside space more to help residents have access to vitamin D or was, or was this not possible? So, so Duncan, um, do you want to maybe pick up the question about outside space? Because obviously you've alluded to quite a few times the size of the organisation and there's quite a, a big footfall there as, as well. Was there anything that you did around that? So we have a, a secure garden um, attached to our house. So we could use that a lot during the summer. Um, and we had, uh, so we just physically distanced the, the tables, you know, the chairs, and we, a, a lot of times, even during the summer, not just last summer, but a lot of summers, we will sit out and have meals outside, you know, and we had, you know, we, we parties at the weekend, um, and just, yeah, we used the outdoor space a lot, and even just now during the winter, some of the residents still like to just put on a coat, go for a walk just to get that fresh air in the space, and we still, you know, accommodate that. So yeah, we use outdoor space a lot. Great, and, and Jane, that first part of that question, because I know you, you spoke about your patients that were confusing with dementia, but was there, was there anything else that you did um, with, with them? That was the question, wasn't it, Sarah? Did I hear that correctly as to? Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the question, was it about social isolation um, it, during yeah, um, so I think our residents that were very aware that they were no longer seeing their relatives in person were um, really deeply affected, um, almost broken hearted actually, and I think 
we can underestimate how the impact that's had on people who were really, really aware of, of what was going on. And um, I think we need to learn from that because we may well be in this situation again. And we need to ensure that we continue with outdoor visiting no matter what happens. And I think we didn't even have outdoor visiting when we first locked down, which was a real issue. Um, and I think we what we did when we could see that person um, being becoming more and more distressed, we, we uh, you know we did allow essential visiting um, to allow, we, we had a, a gentleman that visits his wife every single day and used to spend all day and every day with his wife. And in lockdown, he wasn't allowed to do that. And she was very accepting. They were very accepting of it at the beginning. Um, it, it became a toll and he used to sit outside her room, uh, outside the window uh, and, and staff were becoming worried about him. So we agreed that he could have essential visitor status and he comes every day and visits her. I think we, we have to be very aware about the psychological needs of the residents um, and, and then need to see. And the unknowns for people who are living with dementia because they can't express or may not show overtly how they're feeling, we need to, to be aware of that as well. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, moral distress is, is becoming much more recognised as, as well and the unintended consequences of, of a lot of, of the things that happened are, are also being recognised too, aren't they? So it's, it's a very difficult ethical um, decision making to, as, as, is, as well. It's, yeah. it's not straightforward, but yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking on both sides really, isn't it? Mm. The next question, Sarah? Um, yeah, so this one follows on actually. So we'll, and then I'll go back to some of the earlier ones because um, you both talked about using Zoom. Um, and so someone's asked, would you say a bit more about remote visiting? How can you make effective use of Zoom and so on? Um, and does it work with younger visitors? So how do people see their grandchildren? Duncan, do you want to pick up that question first of all? Yeah, um, so the residents we had to could use the tablets themselves. We just set it up for them. We would connect the call and then we would give them the space to have the privacy to have you know, the conversations with their loved ones. Um, the people who needed a bit more help, you know, just the member of staff would just sit with them and just make sure that they, they could see the, the relative on the tablet and you know, the relative could see them. Um, we had people who, um, yeah, were showing off, you know, the grandkids who were born during like lockdown and it was the first time they were seeing them. You know, we did that. Um, some of our relatives actually just put videos on um, memory sticks and we played videos for them, you know, so we, we did that as well. And it was really just, you know, your residents and you know what support they need and you just facilitate that support. You know, it's as simple as that, you know, you know them and you just help them to do whatever they need to be able to see their loved ones. That memory sticks is really simple. It's a brilliant idea, mm -hmm. isn't it? Something like that too. And, and Jane, anything that, that um, your, you your colleagues... Um, very similar really um they uh, we had we it was very sort of organized right at the beginning it actually tailed off when visiting started but there was still a need to communicate regularly because the visitors aren't coming in if the relatives aren't coming in on a regular basis like they used to you don't get those ad hoc conversations so it kind of we, we still need to have the calls in some way but yes very similar and it was very well organized and 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 they would but it wasn't suitable for everybody some residents couldn't cope with it didn't understand it didn't know what was going on but I think it, it is the next best thing and we're lucky that we have that facility um in in this day and age because you know we could have been in a place where we didn't but it it, it, it there were, I know some people did find it more distressing so that we had to find other means telephone calls sometimes work just as well so one, one size doesn't fit all as, as yeah. you said there then. Great, thanks. Sarah? Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so a couple more uh, link questions from earlier um, on. Um, so uh, Joe um, and other people also commented on this, but nursing in the care sector is highly complex at the best of times, never mind when you layer a pandemic over it. Um, how do we compile and share the learning from this uh, to demonstrate um, our impact um, at system level? So Jane, because Duncan and I touched a bit on that and when I was talking to him, have, have you got any ideas? I mean, obviously we, we spoke about we're still in the pandemic, but, you know, how, how do we capture the link? And I suppose the risk is the longer we're in it, you forget things as well, don't yeah. you? Because things are, are moving at pace. Do you have any ideas around that? I think, I think it's really important that nurses are recognised for the skill uh, and the complexity of the care that they're delivering. Um, they need to be highly competent and, and I think the pandemic has shown that. I mean, it was like that before and then there's, somebody said to me about another layer on, on, on what's going on has added further complexity. We need to um, 
there's a lot of work that we need to do around nursing and care homes and, and there is the transforming nursing roles group which is restarting again and there's also another group looking at clinical care models that we need for care homes. There is um, a new course with Queen Margaret University that has been developed for managers, leaders and anybody or, or leader or nurse leaders it doesn't need to be care home managers, it can be people who want to be lead nurses in care homes and I, and I think once that gets off the ground and we maybe try and get some government funding into that because I think that's really needed. I think somebody said in, in the um, in the questions there that is, we've got people retiring out of the sector, we've got leaders retiring out of the sector, so we need to build and create new leaders and we need to show the complexity of the roles. And Duncan uh, has said there about he's got three students and if they have a good experience, they'll go back and share that. And we have students and they, they do feedback, very positive experience on, on the nursing role. Um, and it's just, we need to showcase it better and we need to talk about it and we need to be proud. I think that's what we need to do. Um, but we know that nursing and care homes have been really hit through the pandemic. So we need to, to build that up again and support the people who work there. And Duncan, anything you want to add to our conversation before when we were talking about it and, and your students and going into to lecture and, and components like that? Yeah, I think it is, it's just, you know, the students who come here, again, the same as Jen, we, we're having good feedback. You know, we have good feedback. They all seem to love the experience and they see, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're at university and you get you, you get your placement as a care home and the head drops and then you come to a place and you see what we actually do here. And it's, and it's, it's word of mouth. They go back, they tell their, their, their peers that, you know what, no care home nursing is complex and busy and you know it's, it's a different thing every day we no two days are the same and it's just showing yeah what we do and what we do on a daily basis and it's just getting that word out there and are you getting many newly qualified staff that are, are now coming in to, to work with you um i've got a newly qualified nurse same as everybody else we're having real problems with recruitment of nurses um but that's not a care home thing that's just you know nurse profession right now um, a newly qualified nurse came to me last year and she has been fantastic you know it's been a breath of fresh air sometimes you know and she came in here never worked in another place um, as her first job young and you know what she brings to it as well you know you, you need that you know, the young and the ideas and she's been fantastic and, and the journey she's been on you know, for the leadership role to, she now leads the team really well um, uh -huh. And, you know, I, I commend her. She's been fantastic. And that's what we need. We need more newly qualified nurses coming to care homes and just seeing what, you know, what they can do for their career as well. And do you think the pay terms and conditions and, and the uh, discrepancy between that and the NHS are, are also working against um, bringing nurses in, into the care sector as well? Yeah. Um, I work for, I'm lucky enough to work for Erskine. And I think Erskine's. Um, you know, pay conditions they contrast well with the NHS, um, but even still, we have problems with you know with retention and, and bringing staff in. Um, yeah, it can be, but it's you know I'm not in this to be rich. You know, I'm, I'm here because I love the job and because I love the residents, and you know this is what I want to do. And you know, it, there's there's different ways of uh, uh, you know that it could be, but People will do it if they want to do it. Yeah, and, and I completely get that as, as well. Just I'm aware that there's quite a, a variety across our different organisations, isn't there, as, as well. And, and, and for the work that um, nurses do in this sector, I, I, I think they should be valued and, and, and that should be recognised as, as well. So completely understand that, you know, it's, it's, it's not always for... For the, the pay, but I, I I do think, and also hearing everybody tonight and what you're saying is as as well. There's a huge amount of fantastic work going on too that should be recognised and, and properly valued as as well. Sarah. Um, so there are a couple of questions as well about um, end of life care. I think when Duncan was, ta was talking about that. Um, so um, David asked in terms of end of life care, what what did you receive in the way of external support from local hospices? Um, if any, and if not, is there anything that would have been valuable to you and your staff? Um, and Celia has also asked about whether uh, care homes have had more deaths than usual from, from other causes and how res other residents and staff um, have been affected by these deaths. So Jane, do you want to pick up the external support? Um, cause, and, and then Duncan, maybe we could talk about the end of life because I know we, we kind of touched on that earlier on as, as well. Uh, so yeah, we, we, um, 
we haven't had any external support for end of life care. We, we actually do provide all end of life care ourselves and we have our own syringe drivers and everything. I think one of the things that would be really good, I know they changed the um, <clears throat> uh, the reprovision of medications, end of life medications that we could use uh, if necessary other people's, but actually I think there needs to be the just in case uh, medications in care homes that for end of life care, because it's always, a you know, one of the things happens, you, you know, you, you need to be prepared and there's nothing worse if it's a weekend and you don't have end of life medication. So I think that's one of the things that does need to change. Um, I think we would, we have a really good, um, our GP practice is really good, our health center and the GPs have been real, real support and will come in and have come in if we wanted them to come in. Um, although I would say they've had a lot less calls from us probably in the, in the pandemic. And I think that's just, a, you know, tantamount to the, the skill of the nurses um, and the care staff. I think, um, I think external support would be there if we, if we need a query about something, but I think because we, we would consider ourselves to, to, to want to provide, it, provide excellence in end of life care, we, we manage that. We did actually have, the only thing we did do actually was we had the, um, uh, somebody from uh, Margaret Kerr unit where the, in, in the borders and they, they gave us um, some training on the new uh, care record called the Creole, which was really good and we're now implementing that. Great. And Duncan, anything to add around the end of life and, and that external support is, as well? I, I know that you were commenting, obviously, how experienced staff had, had got around looking after um, the residents that had symptoms and those that didn't as, as well. Yeah, I think we're the same as Jane here. We provide, you know, the palliative care ourselves. So we, you know, the nurses are trained in using syringe drivers. We've got an advanced nurse practitioner on site who can help us with that as well and she can prescribe the medication we needed, so that helped as well. Um, so no, we didn't really have any external like input either, but we didn't really use it too much before. It was really just it was something really complex and all the pain issues that we couldn't get on top of. That's when we'd use it. But you know, then the last year, no, we've just we just managed it in house. Sarah. Um, yes, there's a couple of questions about um, training and support. Um, so someone has asked about what training courses could be made available to further train staff in a care home. Um, and then from Abadell and Stanley House, we had a comment about how as nurses we are having to support each other constantly with every aspect of managing the pandemic um, and the value of support groups as a source of sharing information, having a shoulder to cry on and someone to turn to for advice. So any so, so Duncan, obviously um, you, you're doing your, your uh, course just now as, as well. Did you choose that specifically because of, of the, the role you're doing just now? Or was, was, you know, was, was there a, a kind of a lot of training courses? I know it's, it's not a training course, it's education, but just trying to understand what the kind of um, landscape is around education, training and, and, and what's required. I think this, this, so this course was offered to me pretty much at the start of the pandemic and I stupidly thought the pandemic was pretty much cleared up by the time I started university. Um, so I know <laughs> that's what I get. Well hoped. Um, <laughs> but no, it's been really interesting, you know, and we, what we found as well is we've got quite a good, um, and, and again, we're lucky here, really good learning and development department, you know, so we took a lot of our training in-house and what we used to have, we used to have a lot of external trainers coming in, but we just stopped that and we just moved it all in-house whether it was or learn pro or we had um, zoom um courses you know where maybe an external one would do that so we could still do the courses but it just it's no you don't get that interactive feel that you get from people in a room together which is a bit of a shame but you know we're still doing still doing plenty of courses excellent um, and so Jane, at first I just saw the um, comment say what Creole actually stood for and you could share the link. So we can certainly facilitate the link going around, but can you share what Creole? Yes, um, if I can remember, for? it's the it's the care record for end of life and it replaced, you know, when we removed the Liverpool care pathway and it's just a care record that a person you can use to help document things and it's, it's been approved by NHS borders, but I, it's, it is on, it, it, I don't think it's online, but I, I can get a copy um, and, and get that sent out to, to we'll, you. We can circulate that. Um, and then the latter part of, of that question that Sarah was saying was around the support groups. Did, uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on that, Jen? Did you set anything up formally or was it just what you were speaking about before around that wrap around i think i actually think that nurses in care homes need a, a network because 
most of them will be working on their own or working a shift on their own. And we've got two care homes on site now, but we didn't used to have. And having the two care homes on site means we've got another nurse not that far away. So that I find that really helpful because I was actually doing nursing shifts during the pandemic because we had two nurses. One was stuck in Dubai and one was furloughed. So um, I was covering shifts and actually I had great support from my nurse in the other building because I was like, how do you do this? You know, because obviously some of the skills you, you're not too, you don't feel too comfortable with. And um, I, I do think we, we our nurses get together once a day at the safety huddle and they have that mechanism of support. And so we will usually have about four nurses that can get together and have a chat. But actually a lot of nurses in care homes will be on their own. I think some people are on their own with 100 residents and, and actually that we need to set up some kind of network, um, a bit like there is a network for care home nurses in England with the QNIS and there's maybe something we can do in, in Scotland because I think it can be quite a lonely job and you sometimes need to share ideas. There's the RCN online forum at the Facebook page as well, which is really good for, for nurses in care homes. But I do think that, that we need that support network, definitely. Yeah, and um, this might be a good time to say that you're actually moving on to pastures new and it may be something that you want to consider in, in, in your, your new job. I don't know if you want to share with everyone. Yeah, yeah. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually going to work with the care inspector as the, um, but I'm going as the chief nurse. Um, so uh, my role will be very much looking at nursing in care homes and very much about looking at what the role is. And and one of, the, one of my tasks will be looking at safe staffing um as well the safe staffing bill which i think is really important and i know there's stuff on paying conditions and you know i i actually think all nurses should be on the same paying conditions i know it's really difficult but we're all nurses and we all deserve the same pay so i don't know whether that'll happen in my lifetime but i you know i'm hoping that i'll maybe meet some of you in my new role anyway and and, and be able to share with me what it's like for you and where you work no, congratulations. I think it's, it's great to have senior nursing leadership in, in, in you know, that, that space. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And, and we've also obviously got Amanda, who's, who's starting as, as new CNO up here as, as well. I actually um, chair the RCN UK Safe Staffing Board, and, and we actually had a, a meeting today as, as, as well, which was, was, was great. And, and I think I saw Anne Marie popping up on, on chat as well, who's our president and who is a, an expert in, in safe staffing that we're delighted to have our expertise too. So I, I think there's a huge opportunity for us to collectively do a really strong piece of work as, as well. So um, I'd be really interested to, to take that forward and, and, and hear from everyone as well. Um, Sarah, can we go back to you with another question? Um, yes, yeah, so there's another question about um, the demonization of care homes um, in the press if an outbreak happens and and how you could keep staff morale up when um, when these sorts of things are being reported in the media. Yeah, it's very difficult, isn't it, with, with that. Duncan, any um, suggestions? Did you come across any time of that to, and, and how you might have dealt with it? Yeah, I think it was in, in the care home itself, we, we knew what we were doing and we knew that we were doing it well, and we knew we were keeping people safe, and we were doing the jobs, you know, to the best of our abilities. Um, but then you would go home and watch the news or read the newspaper, and you were, you know, you were, you were, you were demonised. Um, but it was just reminding the staff that they were doing their jobs, they were doing their jobs well, we were following the guidance, we were following um, fetch prevention control, we were doing what we could, and, you know, we were, they were doing it well, and they were keeping the residents safe. And at the end of the day, you know, Newspapers will sell bad will sell bad stories. We knew what was happening inside the care homes, and we knew that you know what we were doing was 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 good. So we just you know just reminding staff all the time of that. Ignore the bad press. We know what we were doing. And and Jane, any comments on that from you? Yeah, I was heartbroken actually in in what I was reading in the press at the beginning. I remember watching, I was reading this actually, I'd written this down, there was a, there was a care home manager and nurses on, on the news and they had COVID in their care home and actually the, 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 these nurses were so distressed and, and actually nobody cared, and it was almost like nobody cared about the care home nurses or the care home staff actually, all the staff in there and there was the issue with not being able to get into the supermarkets, all that kind of thing, that needs to stop, I mean that is not, not fair and, and I think there were some really nasty things actually on on Twitter about care homes. You know, we're going to, you know, they should go to prison and and things like that. And I remember as a manager thinking, 
goodness me, if, if I get COVID in this care home, it, I'm going to prison. You know, this is, this, this, is, this is how you felt. And I'm sure a lot of care home managers and nurses have felt like that. And I think, I think it's not good. And I think the press, uh, I've had quite a lot to do with the press over COVID and they've been really good at trying to put our story out there. Um, you know, there should have been a two pronged approach to, to managing through a pandemic. I know that nobody knew what they were doing at the beginning, so we can forgive that, but we, we must never be forgotten again. And we must be supported and respected for what we do and uh, the, the complexity of the work that people do. And I, I think we need to, that campaign really to, to, to do a big PR exercise. But the press are on our side. There are, there are press out there who are supporting us and trying to tell our story. And I know Erskine have been part of that as well. And, and I think it's really important if the press are, are able to tell the story for us, we should engage with them. So I, I think it's really important and, and, and I think this tonight, you know, shows the fantastic work and, and that I think as nurses, we're particularly bad at sharing what we do and, and the difference that we make um, from a, an experience and an outcomes perspective as well. I think we, we sometimes, uh, you know, need to, to bang our own drum a little bit more as, as, as well, because we always make the assumption that everybody kind of knows what we're doing. And I think the pandemic has certainly brought us to to the front and, and people have, have recognised a, a lot more, but I think there's still a lot more work to do on, on that. And, and that also links into bringing people from the profession and into this sector as, as well, doesn't it? Um, so yeah, I, I would agree. I think there's a, an opportunity to, to do that. So I'm conscious of the time, we've got five minutes left. Sarah, can you give us a, another question? Um, yes, yeah, so there's only one more question as far as I, I could see in the in the chat, unless something else comes in, which is about the um, infection control guidance and whether you feel there should be um, infection control services specifically commissioned for residential settings. Okay, so I'll kick off with Jane for that. What's your, your thoughts on, on that? Uh, yeah, I think um, the new guidance that's out is that I presume that's the new guidance, the care home guide, the national guidance for care homes that's just been published or is about to be published. Um, I think is really helpful for us so that we all have the same consistent uh, approach to, to infection control. I think I think most of it is going to be what we're doing anyway, um, but it actually gives us that standard. And and, and when when we got the guidance out, we were all referred to the national infection. Um, prevention control manual I didn't know about it so because we had a care home one for the borders that we were using um, so that was interesting so I think I think the new guidance that's out will is helpful we, we did ask I was actually involved uh, I was on that group I think Eric's on that group actually and and we did actually ask for, for it to be separate for care homes but I think it's been put in as an addendum or an appendix so it would have been better for it to be separated so that it was it was for specifically for care homes um it's still i think there's still feedback allowed on it and 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 so i think if people want to comment on it they can but you know i think it's helpful to have a standardized approach for everybody and someone's very helpfully put the link into the chat box as 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 well um and, and duncan your thoughts on on that because i know you said that things were moving at pace as well and, and things were changing too to keep up with with guidance that I'm taking it we're a bit further down the road now that we've got more of a definitive um, framework around it. But what are your thoughts on, on, on that? Yeah, I think, so the care home, yeah, the, the infection prevention control um, addendum gives us a bit of stability. And, you know, and Erskine will use their, they'll derive their infection prevention control um, procedures from that. And then we can, we can push out that learning. And then, you know, so it gives it a bit of stability a bit of time just to get everything in place and you're yeah. the same as what James was saying, we're all working, you know, from the same standard then. Um, and it's, it's much easier to see where we are. So yeah, I think that'll help. Great. So Sarah, just quick check in that all the questions. Um, yeah, that's everything. Nothing else come in. Okay, well, brilliant. Well, on, after that, I just want to really thank again uh, our two experts tonight. It's been a really an inspiring evening and, and fantastic to hear of, of all the learning and, um, and, and, and thank you for, for sharing that as, as well during what has been and continues to be a really difficult time as, as well and I think we all recognise there's still very bumpy times ahead as, as, as well, we're certainly not out of the, the woods yet. Um, but I think you know it's, it's certainly demonstrated uh, what the profession does and, and as we've said several times tonight that we really need to demonstrate it more and, and, and really bang the drum for it for that as, as well. Um, some really sad times but some um, some inspirational times as, as well and I'm certainly sure that um, 
the the residents and and their families have been entirely grateful um, to to the, the work that you've 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 both done. Um, so I'd also like to thank my uh, RCN colleagues tonight as, as well, uh, Sarah, for setting this up and, and, and running the questions, etc. And uh, and my own RCN Scotland colleagues, Shan and, and Emma, who are behind the scenes, who've been um, supporting me as as well. Uh, I hope it's been a uh, helpful and interesting evening for those that have joined us. It's been great to see the number of comments in, in the chat box, and we'll go through them. And if there's anything that we need to circulate, we'll certainly do that as as well. Um, thank you all for taking time out of your, your busy diaries just now and, uh, and, and, and asking questions tonight and, and, and commenting. I really enjoyed it. I look forward to hopefully getting out and meeting everybody face to face at some point as well. It's very strange starting a new role uh, when it's, it's remotely like this and, and not being able to come out face to face and, and hear actually what matters to people and, and from an RCM perspective, you know, what, what we need to be doing too. So please do contact me at any time. Um, and as I say, I look forward to coming out and, and working with you going forward as, as well. And a final thanks again to, to Jane and Duncan. So have a good evening and we will now sign off. Thank you. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.